It's 5 a.m. A protest breaks out near the U.S. consulate. As the sun rises, it's clear this event will not end peacefully. Then, gunfire breaks out, and armed U.S. agents swarm the area. They subdue the attackers, and everyone inside is safe. This scenario was part of a training exercise at the Foreign Affairs Security Training Center located in Blackstone, Virginia. The FASTC is a 1,400-acre urban simulation for training federal agents. At the heart of the campus is this area, known as the Military Operations and Urban Terrain Simulator, or the MOUT. This city was designed from the ground up by the architecture firm Kieran Timberlake. They're known for their exquisite, technically advanced buildings that are located all over the world. This includes a recent $1 billion U.S. Embassy in London, a high-tech glass cube surrounded by a moat. The FASTC facility has an embassy too, but it's a little less flashy than its London counterpart. It was designed to support specific training exercises, and it was developed with the input of the Department of State's experienced subject matter experts. All the parts of the compound that might be difficult to maintain or just aren't necessary for training, those things are eliminated. It doesn't need to have glass in its windows, for instance. But in some ways, this fake version is even more robust than the real thing. For instance, the buildings are made of nearly indestructible reinforced concrete. They need to resist the countless assaults and the real fires of mock attackers. The city is high tech too. It's wired for all sorts of technologies such as cameras and lighting and, and speakers for direct communication with a centralized command. It's just not high tech in the same way as the latest constructions in cities like London, for instance. Everything at the military operations and urban terrain simulator is sort of like a cartoon or a caricature of a real city. But when I call it a cartoon, I don't mean that it's cute or playful, and I'm definitely not undermining its seriousness. It's a sophisticated urban simulator, but its design is ultimately similar to the way that like a caricature artist would interpret the features of people's faces. The entire complex is simplified and exaggerated. A few different street types, sampling of different kinds of intersections and buildings with different heights. At the same time, every door and window is exactly the same. It's almost like a child's drawing of a city, and it sits somewhere pretty low on the uncanny valley graph. In addition to being just a little bit creepy, you might think of it like halfway between a coloring book and a city, like a sketch or an outline that's waiting to be filled in with specifics and details. As it sits, it's everywhere, and it's also nowhere at the exact same time. Any one of these buildings could become a terrorist hideout or a bunker for innocent bystanders. It's only when instructors begin mapping scenarios inside of the empty armature of the city when everything snaps into life and then takes on meeting. Once you pretend it's something specific, then a host of behaviors, reactions, and expectations goes with it. Everything here operates with stereotypes. This is the bad guy. This is the coffee shop where he's hiding. This is a very strange city. And that's because ultimately it's fake. Built from the ground up for a singular purpose. And sometimes by looking at how fake versions of cities work, we can better understand what's most important about the real thing. I think that there's at least four reasons that we build fake cities. FASTC is a simulation. That's the first one. It allows us to rehearse certain scenarios safely without disrupting the delicate balance of any actual city. Survival City in Nevada is another good example of the simulation type. It was built to study the effects of nuclear weapons without damaging a real city. The doomed city was populated with lifelike models. There's other MOUTs out there too. There's the Plyus Training and Research Center, for instance. It actually started life as a real city built for the employees of the Phelps Dodge Corporation, a, a copper smelter. The city has 300 houses, a bowling alley, a store, a post office, and everything that would go along with a town of this size. When the company closed, no one had any reason to stay here, so the entire town was sold to New Mexico Tech. Now it's used for military training, first responders, and, and counterterrorism related work. But unlike the one at FASTC, everything is a touch more realism because it used to be an actual place, and it's also just that much more creepy. Since the area became dedicated to staging disasters in 2004, they've actually expanded the fakeness to include six realistic, other than American or OTA settlements. Four of these are made with pressed earth, and there's a marketplace and a village of 130 rooms and others. Real cities are complex ecosystems, and these kinds of fake versions are part of a proactive approach to stage alterations and ways of navigating them without harming the real thing. 
we have that moral obligation when there are actual real world life or death consequences. We're sending people to some of these very challenging locations. We owe it to them as US citizens to make sure they're prepared. But not all simulation cities are for military purposes. The firm Perkins & Will master planned a fake city is called Pegasus for the company City Lab. It's large enough to house 35,000 residents. It included an entire fake mall, an airport, city hall, churches, power plant, highway suburbs, townhouses, and downtown office buildings. Yet none of those things were ever intended to be inhabited by people. These are all designed to test various urban technologies and things like drones. There's also places like M-City in Ann Arbor. It was designed for testing autonomous vehicles in the early stages of their development. Here there aren't even real buildings, but from the perspective of the sensors and cameras of a car, everything looks normal and includes a range of conditions that one would encounter on a typical car trip. It has multiple road surfaces and a variety of road markings and crossings like pedestrians and railroads. There's also a large straightaway, access ramps, curves, and things like that. Of course, it has traffic signals and traffic signs. There's also a simulated tree cover. And then buildings are just these large, flat cutouts. M-City doesn't look anything like the military operations in the urban terrain simulator. Buildings aren't concrete boxes, for instance. They're just flat billboard images of buildings. Each simulation represents the city in ways that are tailored to seem realistic, but only from the vantage point that they're supposed to be seen from, a car or down the barrel of a gun. False fronts like the ones at M-City show up a lot in fake cities, though, and it was the most important feature of the most famous one. That has to be the fake cities of Gregory Potemkin that were erected along the Dnieper River in 1787. That's when Catherine the Great, the Empress, planned a trip for herself and a few foreign dignitaries to tour and witness the prosperity of the Russian Empire. But things were looking a little bit bleak at the time from the perspective of the river. So the enterprising Potemkin shored things up a little bit by supplementing the route with billboard-like constructions of vibrant cities. Because they didn't have foundations or anything else permanent, the urban images could be set up just in time for the boat to pass by. Once passed, the cities could be dismantled and then transported further down the route for redeployment. Those billboards, they became called Potemkin Villages after that eager people pleaser's last name. And while most historians believe the story is fake, the phrase Potemkin Village has stuck around and has come to mean any prop that's only purpose is to make something look better than the reality. This is the second type of fake city on my list, ones that are used as propaganda. We associate cities with prosperity and growth, and so we fake them so that more powerful entities like governments or corporations can look more prosperous. This example illustrates a huge divide. Potemkin and ultimately Catherine the Great they didn't care how the cities of the empire performed for the communities that were in them. They only cared that they appeared prosperous. Powerful entities, in this case the government, and the communities that are living inside of these cities often have very different ideas about what makes a good version. There are modern day Potemkin villages too. In North Korea, Kijongdong, also known as the Peace Village, is a city in a demilitarized zone. You can see it from South Korea, and it's even planned to face that direction specifically. When viewed from South Korea, it appears to be a well-maintained, idyllic village with high-rise buildings and things like hospitals and childcare centers. It presents an image of North Korean prosperity to entice South Koreans to defect. But it's pretty clear from observation and defector testimonies that the village is almost completely uninhabited. It's a smokescreen. Most of the buildings are just hollow shells, without windows or even rooms inside. Lights are set on timers so they go on and off in realistic ways, all for the sake of maintaining the illusion of normalcy. It's also home to some of the world's largest flagpoles. One of them holds the North Korean flag that's so big that it weighs 270 kilograms or 600 pounds. Clearly, this fake city is only about sending the message of prosperity. Its entire existence is about psychological and propaganda warfare. In this sense, fake cities are gateways to imagined worlds. Things like false fronts or giant flagpoles present images of heightened and parallel realities. This is also the goal of places like amusement parks, like Disneyland or, or Universal Studios. These places are masters of illusions that use fake cities to offer an escape. I think that this is the third type of fake city on my list. Ones that are meant to transport us mentally and allow us to relax and ultimately just take our money. These spaces are designed to be immersive. They allow visitors to step into a different world, be it a fantasy kingdom or a futuristic city or a recreation of a historic town. With streets built to commemorate the old Wild West. 
The intention to detail here is vital for pulling off the effect with every building, street, and prop contributing to a cohesive visual narrative. These environments, they're not just about what they look like either. They engage all the senses, and they usually incorporate interactive elements to be able to draw us in. Main Street USA and Magic Kingdom, for instance, uses strategies like forced perspective to make the city feel even more immersive. The edges of the street are angled so that the length looks longer when you arrive, but then shorter when leaving at the end of the day. Similarly, the first floor is built at a normal one-to-one -one scale, while the upper floors of the buildings are smaller. And this makes them look further away, and so the overall buildings look taller. There's also an entire city underground that helps the top layer to work without ever getting cluttered up. This is a complicated machine, probably more complex than any real city. It's all completely engineered to offer a realistic city-like experience, but without all the friction of a real one. I'd also put movie sets into this category, but either way, these fake cities are idealized, sanitized versions of reality. They offer escapism from the gritty complexities of actual urban life. The image of prosperity that's associated with cities, it also makes them targets for destruction during wartime, and so it's important to protect them as landmarks. So a fake city might also be used as like a decoy to confuse or distract any would-be invaders. In the later stages of World War I, the Germans developed long-range bombers that were able to reach Paris. The French, when they became aware of this threat, decided to create a decoy city to be able to mislead German pilots and divert their attackers away from actual Paris. The fake version is constructed to the northeast of the real one, near the towns of Maison Lafitte and Le Minilois. It was designed to mimic the Parisian cityscape, complete with a replica of the Seine River and distinctive areas that resembled the industrial zones and the railway stations of Paris. It included elements that would be visible during nighttime bombing raids, like electric lights and railway tracks. The lights were designed to mimic the city's railway yards and, and the streets, and it created the illusion of normal activity. The railways were these elaborate sets of tracks with fake trains on them too, which were moved around to simulate activity. The decoy was built for one purpose only, to fool German bomber planes at night. In any other scenario, the fake city, it bore almost no resemblance to anything that we would call a city. And I find this really fascinating. In real cities, spaces evolve organically and they serve multiple, even sometimes overlapping purposes. But when you see these fake renditions, they're kind of creepy because they're overly uniform. They're predictable and obviously empty. They're simultaneously everywhere. They could be located anywhere. And they're nowhere, not representing anywhere specific. They embody the generic and the specific at the same time. They also don't evolve over time. And they're treated like a sacrificial limb that we could just let go at any time. But looking at these fake versions can sometimes offer clearer insights into urban dynamics and human behaviors than the study of real cities with all their complexities and unpredictability getting in the way. And their strangeness marks the distance between how we need cities to work and how we expect them to look. Las Vegas is probably the clearest example of a city that takes full advantage of the fake city playbook of design techniques. It has false fronts, illusionistic perspectives, and a host of others. It's the ultimate version of a leisure capital type of fake city that I talked about, like a Disneyland for adults. The newest and flashiest fake monument that they have over there is the gigantic light-up sphere. The otherwise darkly colored ball-shaped building uses millions of little LED lights to be able to masquerade as other things, like a spinning basketball or a smiley face. And that's the subject of my next video, which explores the origins and the architectural concepts of this sphere. And while it's not out yet on YouTube, it is available to watch right now on the streaming platform Nebula. Honestly, without Nebula support, I would not be able to provide you with such consistent, high-quality content like this. It's a creator-owned platform for video and podcasts that offers an incredible value for you, the viewer, and the highly curated set of over 150 educational creators that are on it, like me. Sam at Wendover Productions, Real Engineering, Not Just Bikes, City Beautiful, and many more of the folks that you watch are on there. On Nebula, you'll be able to gain access to our regular videos early, just like my Sphere video. But there's also exclusive content that you won't find anywhere else. Sometimes when I get a tour of a place or interview someone that's especially interesting, I'll publish a separate video for folks that want to learn more. It's an entirely new video of mine with more of my reactions, coupled with insights from others that just did not quite fit into the narrow framing of the original YouTube video concept. 
So there's explorations like the extended tour that I got of a unit of Marina City, or the deep dive into the history of the city Bilbao, Spain, that I took with my friend Iker Gill. Finally, and probably the most exciting, are the Nebula Original series. One that I think you might like is Real Life Lore's Modern Conflicts. It's a fantastic documentary series, and it explores and explains the complex armed conflicts that have occurred since 1980. Or alternatively, you might like City Beautiful's deep dives into how each of the world's greatest cities came to be. But who knows, maybe I'll get to have an original on there soon. You can gain access to this world of amazing content simply by clicking on the link on the screen, and it's also listed at the top of the description. From there, you can sign up for whatever way you'd like. The most economical way is to choose the option that's $2.50 per month when you sign up for a year. Or if you really value this channel and want to show the absolute maximum amount of support that you can, you can choose the lifetime option. It's like the, the angel investor tier. Either way though, you'll unlock the entire catalog of treasures of your favorite creators. All the while, you'll be directly supporting this channel to share my takes on the buildings that structure our world. See you over there, and as always, thanks for watching.